Good morning. Glad you're here today. If you're visiting with us, I hope you've been made to feel especially welcome today. I want to ask if you would please to take your Bible, or if you didn't bring a Bible with you, there's one in the pew that you're in. Could you please just open that up to Revelation? We're going to be studying the book of Revelation chapter 21 today. Today I want to spend some time talking to you about heaven. You see, I've never been there, but I'm planning on spending a lot of time there when I retire. And I'm not sure if you're planning to go or not, but I would highly recommend that that be a part of your plans for the future. Because it's going to be amazing. Heaven. There's been a lot of confusion, I believe, surrounding this eternal paradise. Like, where is it at? What is it like? What will we do? I found it interesting this morning, and Brian Bliss can attest to this. We were kind of uh, back there this morning getting things ready. And as my tradition, my my habit, my routine of the day is, I always go to CNN.com, check out the headlines for the day. And I hadn't done that yet, so I was back at the computer this morning doing that. You know, one of the articles uh, on CNN's website right now, today, is, if heaven is so important to Christians, why doesn't the church talk about it more? (laughs) And I thought, CNN, you need to come to Burnside Christian Church today because we're going to talk about heaven. And and, and I got news for you. We're going to talk about heaven, not because CNN.com criticized the fact that we're not talking about it, but because it's an important truth for you and I to realize. You see, as a preacher, I've done my fair share of funerals. There are guys who've done more funerals than I have, but certainly there are people who have done less funerals than I have. And while I'm either at the visitation or or while I'm sitting down with the family to kind of go over the details of their loved one's funeral, at some point you can be guaranteed that the discussion or the topic of eternity will come out. And oftentimes, especially at the funerals of unbelievers, but sometimes even at the funerals of Christians, I hear some pretty strange things. And I think some of the things that are said in those moments when their loved one dies is stuff that maybe they've kind of got from Hollywood or maybe cartoons when we were growing up. I'm not sure where it gets its origination from. But here's a news flash. If you're getting your theology from Hollywood, bad plan, okay? Bad plan. I've heard things like, well, I guess God just needed them in heaven more than we needed them. Have you heard that at a funeral? Listen, heaven is for our benefit. It's God's gift to us. We aren't there because God needs us there. We aren't there because somehow God's doing us a solid, you know, we're doing God a solid favor. Like, you're welcome, God. I'm here. I'm here for you. That's not how it works in heaven. It's it's God's gift to us. That's what heaven is. I've heard things like said as well, especially when, when babies die, and it's such a tragic thing. Well, I guess God needed another angel. And there's such a misconception about angels. Listen, it's a fact, and it's, it's a fact that all babies, when they die, they go to heaven. Fact. But it's not a fact that all babies become angels. In fact, nobody becomes angels when you go to heaven. We're going to talk more about that later. I think some of this angel uh, misconception has come from some Hollywood movies. You probably are familiar with this one at least. What's the name of this movie? It's a Wonderful Life. And do you remember the little girl's name in this movie? She had a strange name. Zuzu. That's exactly right. Zuzu. What a strange name. But anyway, do you remember Zuzu's like famous line of this entire movie? Remember what it was? Teacher says, every time a bell rings, an angel gets its wings, right? Hey, Zuzu, your teacher's wrong. Really? You you think that every time a bell rings, an angel, where do we get this stuff? Not from the Bible, not from God's Word. And I think that people have this idea that when we do get to heaven that, you know, we're going to be sitting on clouds and we're going to be playing harps. That sounds boring to me, (laughs) if you ask me. That sounds sounds horrible, okay? Now, there's going to be harps in heaven. We do know that. But nowhere in the Bible are we told that we're going to all pick up our harps and play in harmonious chorus together, okay? We're not told that. I think another misconception that people um, have is that you really can't know if you're going to heaven until you die. And then when you get to he- when you die, you're going to be at the gates of heaven. And who's going to be sitting at the gates of heaven? Who? 
St. Peter's going to be... That's nowhere mentioned in Scripture, okay? But somehow, you know, we get this idea or people think that, that when you die, you're going to go to heaven and then you're going to have this encounter with St. Peter. And he's going to be there and he's going to ask you some questions. And if you don't have the right answer to those questions, well, see you later. Trap door opens, you're going to hell, right? We've got that misconception. We're told that we are going to be judged not before Peter, before God Almighty himself. That's what God's Word says, okay? All this stuff, all these misconceptions about heaven is really tragic. It's really sad because the Bible does have some facts to give us about heaven. And that's what this sermon series is all about. I've entitled this sermon series, Heaven Is For Real. And contrary to the title of this sermon series, this will have nothing to do with the book by the same title. You see, I want you to know and understand the hope of heaven that is waiting for you. And so as now, we're going to look at the book of Revelation, chapter 21. By the way, I want to talk about this, if I can, just for a moment. Uh, Revelation, it's the book of Revelation, singular, not plural. There was one revelation given to, jo to John. There was one thing, this, this was an ongoing thing that he's trying to write all this down and it's, it's what was revealed to John. There's one revelation, it's the book of Revelation, okay? And you may recognize the author of Revelation, it was by the guy by the name of John. And it was written around 90 A.D., 60 years after Jesus died, resurrected and went back to heaven. And in the book of Revelation, an angel, a messenger of Christ, comes to John and he reveals some stuff to John that is yet to come. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever read the book of Revelation, just sat down and opened it and sat down from cover to cover of Revelation and just read it in one sitting? There's 22 chapters. It doesn't take very long at all. That's how I spent some of my time this past week. And I have to tell you, as I was rereading Revelation, it was astonishing. It was almost terrifying, some of the things that take place in the book of Revelation. And maybe you're thinking, yeah, I don't bother reading it because there's a lot of stuff I'm not going to understand. There's going to be some stuff you're not going to understand in Revelation, okay? But you're really not going to understand it if you don't read it, okay? There's some things we can gain as fact from Revelation. And so... As I was sitting there and I was reading Revelation this past week, some of these things were coming to mind. I was like, man, this is really terrifying. And you know what it did for me? And I know it would do this for you too if you sat and read it. I need to go tell people about who Jesus Christ is. I need to get up off my rear end, get out there, because there are people who are not going to experience heaven. There are people who are not going to go to heaven. And I need to do what I can to get the message of Jesus Christ in their hands, the words of life in their hands that they might have it. So, Revelation starts off, and an angel of Jesus Christ comes to John. He's been exiled to the island of Patmos. He's there, and an angel of Jesus Christ comes and tells him that he needs to write some things down because he's going to be, uh, this angel is going to reveal to him some things which are yet to happen. And in Revelation chapter one, 21, now heaven is revealed to him. Look at Revelation chapter 21. We're only going to read the first eight verses of Revelation 21 this morning. John writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. And he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning, or crying, or pain, for the first things have passed away. Verse 5. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. 
So here's our text this morning. And as we read those first eight verses there of Revelation chapter 21, did you notice five facts about heaven? I did. And I want to share those with you. Here's the first fact about heaven. In heaven, everything is new. Everything is new. Look at verses 1, 2, and 5. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. Verse 5. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. Let me ask you a question. How many of you guys like new stuff? You like new stuff? (laughs) Yeah, I do too. I don't think there's a thing wrong with liking new stuff. God made us to like new stuff. That's why heaven and earth and the new city are all going to be new, okay? I've said this before, but I want to say it again. It's the little things in life sometimes that bring you the most joy, right? And and there's very few things that can compare to a new toothbrush, The feel of when you stick that in your mouth and the bristles that are firm and, oh man, it's just great. How about a new pair of socks? The joy of a new pair of socks, the way they tightly fit around your calf. They're white. They're not stained. They don't have holes in them. They're great. How about a newly made bed with fresh sheets? You like that too? Man, very few things better in life than that which is new. And a lot of us, I think, like new things. We may not have new things because we're trying to be a good steward of what God has given to us. But if you had your preference, you would always choose new. You would always choose new. God knew that. And so, when we get to heaven, guess what? It's going to be a new heaven. There's three ways that heaven is used in the Bible. It talks about three different types of heaven. The first heaven that it talks about is the sky. Uh, that, that atmosphere. That stuff that, that birds and planes fly in. The stuff where clouds live. That's what the first heaven is. The Bible also talks about a second heaven. And the second heaven is where the stars and the planets are. Uh, we know it as outer space. It's the stuff that astronauts visit. Okay? It's, 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 that's the second heaven. But then there's a third heaven. And the third heaven is, is like heaven, heaven. You know what I mean? It's the place of eternity. It's the place where God dwells. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, you need to study that this week and have your mind blown. Paul is talking about a, a moment in his life when he was caught up to the third heaven. And he's talking about, listen, I was in heaven, heaven. I wasn't like floating with the birds. I wasn't even floating with the astronauts. Man, I was in heaven. He's talking about where God lives. So when John in our text says he saw new heaven, he means all three of those things. All three realms that were originally created are going to pass away and they're going to be replaced. And not only is God going to recreate the heavens, but guess what else is going to be new? We're going to have a new earth. So your house... Your address where you live, not going to be around. No more Burnside Christian Church building. No more Hancock County. No more Grand Canyon. No more United States of America. No more Mississippi River. No more Mount Everest. It's all going to be gone. It's all going to be replaced. It's going to be made new. And it's going to be glorious. Not only that, but we also are told that we get a new city. Verse 2 says, And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. Four qualities about this new city that I want to share with you that the scripture talks about. The first is this, that it is going to be a holy city. Hey, uh, what are some of the descriptions of, of American cities that we have? What's Philadelphia known as? The city of? Right, right. What about Las Vegas? What is it known as? Sin City, right? Right, yeah. We don't have any holy cities here in America. We don't. In fact, I don't think there's any holy cities in the world. Even the holy land has sin in it. But the city that God is preparing for us that we will have, that we will dwell in, is going to be a holy city. Free from sin. Righteous, pure. 
Now, I don't know if they have newspapers in heaven or not, but if, you, if they do, if you wake up in the morning, I don't even know if we're going to sleep. We'll talk about that later. But it, when, you, when you read the newspaper every day in heaven, it's going to be filled with good news. There's no bad news. There's no sin. There's no corruption. There's no crime. Holy, pure, sinless. That's what kind of city we're going to dwell in. Secondly, notice also it's, it's from God. The city is from God. Who wants to go to heaven that isn't prepared by God? That didn't come from God? And that leads us to the third characteristic that it's, it's prepared. It's made ready. In John chapter 14, we're going to read this a little while later, but in John chapter 14, Jesus tells us that he has been preparing a place for us. Ever since he's left this earth, he's been preparing this place for us to live in, this new Jerusalem. Think about what God made in six days. Six literal days. Think about everything that God created. And here, God's been spending the 2,000 years plus that he's been gone creating, making, preparing. Amazing. Holy, from God, prepared. But then John tries to describe heaven, and he thinks of a picture. He's, he's like, um, uh, what, what can you guys understand or relate to? And the picture of heaven that he has in his head, it's like this. He's like, it's like a bride adorned for her husband. Now, now men, think back to your wedding day. And you can remember standing at the front of the church, waiting for your bride to enter the room, and suddenly the back doors fling open. The preacher gives the, the, the command to everyone to stand. And there she is. And oh man, she looks amazing. Now, I've been to a lot of weddings. I've I performed a lot of weddings. And this is a fact. And you would think it wouldn't be, but it is a fact. I've never seen an ugly bride. Gospel truth. I've never seen an ugly bride. And you know what? Heaven is prepared just as much preparation goes into the wedding day for the bride. That is how much preparation is going into the holy city we're going to live in. And it's going to be beautiful. Amen for new stuff? In heaven, everything's new. Everything's new. Here's the second fact. In heaven, God is near. Verses 3 and 7. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them. And they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. Verse 7. He who overcomes. I want to stop and just pause on that phrase right there. I love that phrase. He who overcomes. Uh, overcomes what exactly, John? He who overcomes the difficulties of this life. I love John's honesty here. He, he's, not, he's not trying to, to paint a, a rosy picture. He's been exiled on an island, away from his friends, away from his family. He knows life is hard. Life is not easy. It's not easy being a Christian. It's not easy being a follower of Jesus Christ. And he's like, hang in there. Because for those of us who overcome, for those of us who are faithful until death, guess what? He says, he who overcomes will inherit these things. And I will be his God, and he will be my son. You see, in heaven, with God being near, we will have a perfect relationship with God. You see, a lot of us have a relationship with God now, but it's not a perfect relationship. You still mess that relationship up. I still mess that relationship up with sin, right? You understand that. It's not a perfect relationship. But when we get to heaven and sin is no longer in the picture, we will have perfect intimacy with God. It's interesting that throughout Scripture, God has always been pictured as being present, but at a distance. You think back to the temple. God in the Holy of Holies was separated from his people by a thick veil, a curtain. And yes, even when Jesus died on the cross, that curtain, that veil was torn from top to bottom. But let me tell you something, because of our imperfect nature, because of our sin, God has always been a little bit further away from us than what we would like. But not now. In this new heaven, God will be dwelling among the people. I don't think you and I are ever going to grow old of that. 
Now, this is a difficult thing for us to understand because the Bible says that no one can look at God's face and live. And so what I think we have to understand here is that when we're dwelling with God, we will be with God, but we won't see God the Father. We will, however, see God the Son. And won't it be great to sit down and talk with Jesus? To sit down with him personally wouldn't it be great to ask him some questions? What questions would you like to ask Jesus when you sit down and have a conversation with him? What would you like to ask him? What was it like when you were a boy, Jesus? The Bible really doesn't talk a little bit about that. What was it like? Tell me about the 12 disciples. Tell me what it was like when, when you were creating things at the beginning of time. We're going to have perfect intimacy with him. But did you notice... That in verse 7, there was another promise. Verse 7 says that because of the relationship we're going to have with God, that we're going to inherit all things. We're going to inherit all things. I love my folks, but they're not super wealthy. When they die, I'm not going to get much in the way of material gain, and that's okay. I love them very much, and I'd rather more time with them than to receive all the stuff they have when they're gone. But when I die, boy, that's when I have it all. That's when I have it all. All things of God will be mine. As a son of the heavenly father, what's his is mine. And listen, it's going to be awesome. Everything is new. God is near. Here's the third fact about heaven, and it is the best fact about heaven I think there is. No more pain. Verse 4 is by far the most comforting verse for Christians. It clearly defines the hope that is ours in Christ. Because as I said before, John knows that life is hard, that it is difficult. And here we see a beautiful truth unfold. In verse 4 he writes, And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. The question, who is he talking about? Who is it that's removing the tears? It's God, the Son, removing tears. I couldn't help as I was reading over this verse 4, uh, a movie for, that I watched when I was younger popped in my mind. Maybe you've seen it. It's Tom Hanks, and he's in that movie, A League of Their Own. Remember this? League of Their Own. Uh, he was the coach of this um, women's baseball team, and um, this one woman baseball player did something wrong on the field, and he calls her into the dugout, and he's just giving it to her, you know, what were you thinking? You messed up, you know? And he turns around, he's getting ready to walk away, and she begins to cry. And he hears it, and he turns around, and remember what he says? Are, are, are you crying? Oh, are you cr why are you crying? And what does he say? There's no crying in baseball. You can't cry at baseball. I want to tell you something. You will not be able to cry in heaven. Did you know that? You're not going to be able to, even if you wanted to. There's no crying in heaven. He will remove every tear from their eyes. Now, think about what causes you to cry in this life. For me, it's not physical pain for me. I don't know about you, but in my adult life, I can't tell you the last time I cried because I was physically hurt. And I mean, I had a kidney stone, okay? And I didn't cry. I didn't shed any tears over that. And it was painful. But I have cried. I have cried over emotional pain. Over, over the breaking of my heart, over disappointments that have happened. Uh, tear here in verse 4 is symbolic of the things on earth that cause you emotional pain. The things that maybe dashed your hopes or your dreams. The things about which you silently anguish and wonder, why did this happen? And there is this picture of Jesus in heaven caring enough to wipe tears away from your face. And putting an end to all the pain. There is no sadness in heaven. The text goes on to say, not only is there no more tears, but there's no more death. Think on that just for a moment. No death. Think about all the ways that death scars the human experience. There's not going to be any funerals, no funeral homes, no caskets. Sorry, Jim. 
that's okay. You're going to have a new job because all things are new, okay? No tombstones. No leaving loved ones behind. No heart-wrenching goodbyes. And if there's no death, then that means there's no dealing with the things associated with death. Dealing with the sickness that maybe spurs on death. No doctors. Sorry, Doc Davis. No babies. Sorry. <laughs> no pills. No surgeries. No band-aids. No allergic reactions. No older people. No senior citizen discounts. No arthritis. No younger people. Everyone will be in the same ageless state. We're going to talk more about that in weeks to come too. All together, we will be moving forward in the same ageless eternity towards joy. That's going to be pretty amazing. There's also not going to be any mourning. Think about what causes you to mourn. We've already touched on it a little bit, but maybe it's your personal failures as you reflect on life and as you think, man, I wish I could have done that. But the regrets you may have in life. There's not going to be any of that. There's not going to be any regrets of the decisions of your loved ones. Listen, you won't mourn those things anymore. You mean I won't remember those things? You mean I, I won't be saddened by the fact that my loved ones who maybe never accepted Jesus Christ are not with me? I, I won't know that? I don't know. Either you won't remember it or you will remember it and it won't make you sad. But either way, it's not going to bother you. You won't have any bad days in heaven. And I'm looking forward to that. And here's the great one too. No pain. I put physical pain, but I think better, just no pain. Perfect health, perfect experience, perfect relationships with God, with others. No pain of any kind, physical or any other. And every day in heaven, you will feel great. No more aches or pains. Uh, you know a stupid thing that's, that's, that would, you know something stupid that you would be said in heaven would be, have a great day. People are like, are, are you new here? Every day is great, you know? That's what, that's what he's going to be like. Every single day that we are there is going to be great. Here's the fourth f fact about heaven. In heaven, satisfaction is guaranteed. Look at verse 6. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts and from the spring of water of life without cost. One scholar points out the phrase, it is done. These are the final words of human history. What were the first words of recorded human history? They were by God then as well. They were the words, let there be light. And Jesus says, I am the Alpha and I am the Omega. And you know this, Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. And essentially what Jesus is saying is this, I finish what I start. I was there in the beginning. I'll be there in the end. You see, there's a lot of people who are good at starting stuff and not finishing it. Not so with me. I finish what I start. I'm wrapping it all up. And then Jesus says, I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. Here's the idea that is pictured. I didn't know how else to put it. So I put it this way, rightful abundance. And I use that word rightful abundance because I've experienced a lot of wrongful abundance at buffets. You know what I mean? Where you just eat and you're like, oh, I'm just so sick, you know? And you want to explode. In heaven, there is rightful abundance you will be 100% satisfied. You will not be longing, but you're not going to be miserable either. You see what I'm saying? It's a rightful abundance. There's not going to be any phrases like, man, I'd sure like to have. Or, I'm looking forward to the day when Jesus says you will drink freely. You won't be discontent. Everything you desire will be righteous and it will fulfill you forever. You will always be content. You won't ever get with a little group of people in the corner of heaven and be like, well, that really stinks, doesn't it? There's not going to be any criticism in heaven or complaining. Everyone in heaven will 100% be satisfied and content. And let me tell you, 
that's something that only God can do. He can make everybody content at the same time. Can we do that? The answer is no, we cannot. No, we cannot. God can, and that's what heaven is going to be like. Satisfaction guaranteed. Now, our text takes a little bit of a twist. John wanted to make sure that his readers didn't get so caught up in all the wonderful things about heaven that they thought they were going there if they weren't. And so, as he's listing all these awesome things about heaven, well, then we come to verse 8, and it's the last fact about heaven, and it's a serious fact about heaven, and the fact is this, not everyone is going there. Are you? Are, are you going there? Let me read verse 8. But for the cowardly and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You see, I think another misconception people have, and I, I've heard this a lot at funerals too. Well, at least they're in heaven. Are they? I think truly the majority of people think that when they're dying here and when they leave this, they're going to be in heaven. And that's not what the Bible teaches. The only way a person gets to heaven is if they go through Jesus Christ. If they have a relationship with Jesus Christ. If Jesus knows you and you know Jesus, that is how you're getting to heaven. And the Bible's really clear on that. Maybe this part of the sermon speaks to you personally. Maybe you don't know who God is. Maybe you don't know who Jesus is. Maybe this speaks to a family member, a friend, a neighbor, a co-worker, a schoolmate. But I'm telling you, there are people out there who aren't going to heaven. You can't read the Bible seriously and conclude that when everybody dies, we all go to heaven. Let me give you some examples of this. Hopefully you already know this. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 12, he puts it really plainly. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. How much more plain can it be? Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it, for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. This is a sad fact. Did you know that the vast majority of people will be in hell? Did you know that? That's sad. But that's what God's word says. That's what God's word says. And you have an opportunity this morning that if you're hearing this and you're like, wow, you can accept and receive the free gift of salvation. God is, has placed you in a, a place this morning where you can hear the message of salvation, grab hold of it, grab hold of Jesus, and change your destiny, change your eternal state forever. We all know John chapter 3 verse 16, but do we know John chapter 3 verse 18? He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he who has not believed in the name of the, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. I want to end this morning with a conversation that unfolds in John chapter 14. I alluded to it earlier, but Jesus is having, it's his last night on earth with, with his disciples. He just got done washing their feet in John chapter 13, and he's told them some pretty serious things. He's like, listen, I'm, I'm going to die shortly. I'm going to be taken away from you. I'm going to go to heaven. And, and, and that was bothersome to his disciples. And he could tell that by the look on their face. Their demeanor was just, wow, wow, Jesus, this is horrible news. And in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, he gives some very enlightening news, some hopeful news. And he says to this, he says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may also be. And you know the way where I'm going. And Thomas said to him in a very real moment, he's like, but Lord, we do not know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him this very pointed, this very exclusive truth. He said to him, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you're not sure you're going to heaven, 
Let me ask you this question this morning. Have you gone through Jesus Christ to get there? Have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? If you have never come to the place in your life where you recognize that you're a sinner, that you can't earn your way to heaven, that you're not good enough to get there on your own, if you've never come to the conclusion that Jesus Christ died for your sins, if you've never accepted him as your personal Lord and Savior, then the good news is that can change. You're hearing the message of salvation presented to you. You may have questions. You may not have it all figured out. But we can sit down and we can talk about that. And I can show you scriptures that you need to listen to and read to. But if that describes you today with something you've never done, today is the day.